Welcome back, Raider Nation. It is time for another enthralling edition of Silver and Black Today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering your Las Vegas Raiders. Yes, welcome back to you. Hope you're having a great summer. It is July. I know Las Vegas set a temperature record, 120, 120 degrees on Monday. It was a record for the city of Las Vegas. Palm Springs down in California, 124. But it's hotter in here because Mo and I are here. That's right. My partner, Mo Moten. <laughs> who is the senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report. He is also a columnist at sportsnot.com where you can catch my work. He writes on the Raiders. He's a Raiders columnist there. You can also catch him on TNT and the Turner Networks during the football season. He'll give you that information when it pops up. But he is all over town. He is Midtown Mo. I am Scalco Branson. You can follow Mo, by the way, on x.com at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully, the show, SNB Today. And remember, subscribe wherever you get your audio. We'd appreciate the ratings there, too. Always appreciate the love and the respect. It's mutual from us to you, you to us. We appreciate that. Mo, okay, we're back here. We're going to have a fun show today. But it's interesting, you know, this time of the year, especially, and I was telling you before we went on the air, I was working on a story for sports not, not related to football, But this is what I call this like four week period in sports journalism as I call it the list season, right? Because there's baseball going on and that's about it. We have women's basketball with WNBA and then you're waiting for the Olympics to start this year. So there's a lot of lists. So even when I'm looking to just read, I'm looking at Raider stuff. I'm looking at whatever NFL. I see a lot of lists. So I just want to tell our listeners and our viewers out there, you'll see lists from Mo and I too, but just understand it's just part of what we have to do. <laughs> right, man? You, you, I'm sure you're going to have some lists popping up pretty soon. Yeah, I'm going to be the list guy up until <laughs> <laughs> up until the preseason starts. Though I will have some, I'll, I will have some intriguing pieces over on sports now, uh having to do with the Raiders. So look out for those. That's good. intriguing. Intriguing minds want to know. What was that? I forgot what that was. That was like in National Enquirer or some crap like that. But anyway, not to put Mo's work in that field because that's not what it is. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yes. So so a lot of stuff coming up. But we're only a few days now away. As we talk, it's, it's one month and 29 days until the Raiders' first regular season game on September 8th. Man, it went fast. I swear it was just like three months. It's, I remember because I have a clock on my little thing back here. It tells me how many days it is. And I, I swear, Mo, it was like three months, like five days ago. But it, it can time never come flies. too soon. Time flies when you're having fun making lists, right? Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. And when you get older like me, it just, just starts going by faster. It's like, yeah, you're on the back nine, and then suddenly you know it, you're in the clubhouse. So there you go. But today we're going to go through it. And I know we did a couple weeks ago, we did our top – uh, five Raiders quarterbacks of all time and got a lot of great comments, a lot of great debate. Some people agreeing with most of our list and then some other people with some recency bias. You know, if you're 22 years old and you talk about Daryl LaMonica, you might not know unless you're really a historian into the Raiders uh, culture and the Raiders history, but uh, good stuff so far. So what we decided today was we're going to go through running backs there's a lot of good running backs in Raiders history. You you might not think of some of these guys because, again, they were in eras when even when I was a kid. But nonetheless, uh, these are guys that we wanted to talk about. And, Mo, when you looked, when you start, when you sat down, because you know, I got in touch with you and said, hey, we're going to do a show on the top five running backs. What When you started to think about and go through your list, and we'll get to our top five in a minute, but when you started to go through your list, kind of what was your, what were you thinking? Uh, of like the parameters of how you were going to rate the top five running backs. Mostly production. Mm. Production is key. It's not, it's different from the quarterback list and the fact that quarterbacks are usually the, a big part of the team's winning or their success Super Bowl wins. So when we talked about, you know, Kenny Stabler, we talked about Jim Plunkett. We said, okay, they were part of Super Bowl winning teams that mattered. It matters a little less for the running back position because unless the running back is, you know, winning a rushing title the year that they w- the Raiders win the Super Bowl, then it's different. Or the a year that they go deep in the playoffs, then it's different. If your running back is the workhorse of your offense, kind of like a Christian McCaffrey like player in today's league. If it's that type of running back, then, yes, it has he has much to do with your success. But if it's a running back that has a good year, 
but the offense is balanced or has or is pass heavy, then the running back position doesn't, for me, doesn't weigh as heavily as the quarterback position when it comes to wins and losses and Super Bowl wins. There you go. So we're going to give you these, and, and I'm interested to hear what people have to say and, and what you're going to be surprised with our list. Like, what will you be surprised by? Um, and it's really interesting. I had people, I have people, some really people passionate about quarterbacks they felt we left off the list, all of which I had good answers for, I felt, um, because, I mean, even somebody was like, George Bland. It's like, well, George Blanda played one game at quarterback for the Raiders. <laughs> <laughs> right. It wasn't like, I mean, great player. Obviously it's George Blanda, but um, there was guys like that and other, and other players. When you looked at the numbers, you talked about production and you looked at time uh, with the Raiders and what they did, that that's how we came about that list. And so I stick by it. And there was, there wasn't really, I mean, there was a couple guys, I think that were five, six, you know, fringe type guys. We talked about some of them, Hostetler, those guys. But um, at the end of the day, you looked at longevity, you looked at stats, you looked at um, the impact. Obviously, Jim Plunkett, we talked about that. So with running backs, we're going to do the same thing. And Mo, I'm going to start with this one at number five, and I want you to tell me what you think, and I'll give you a rundown of why. So, so at number five, I chose Darren McFadden, okay? I have Darren oh. McFadden, McFadden because this guy, listen, if you look at Darren McFadden, you watch the film, and I watched highlights today, as a matter of fact undeniable talent but he just couldn't stay healthy he just had an injury plagued career now that doesn't mean you know there's a lot of guys who had injury plagued careers who had great um uh talent but you look at mcfadden exceptional speed he had big game changing plays you look at that big season in 2010 1157 yards and of course with the raiders he had 4247 yards and 25 touchdowns but if you go back, and I hear, I heard that a lot. Whenever I talked to a lot of Raider fans, when I was in Las Vegas, and people would talk about uh, 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 Josh Jacobs at the current time, uh, they would talk about, man, if we could get a guy like Darren McFat. He was one of those guys who you felt like, if he who could have stayed healthy, would have been, would have been a top three type of guy. I mean, that's how I think a lot of Raider fans felt about felt about him. And he's, you know, there's recency there. You're talking only 14 years ago. Uh, and when you're talking about Darren McFadden's career, but I have him at number five. Of course, he played from 2008 through 2014. So Darren McFadden is my number five, Mr. Moten. Man, I remember a lot of Darren McFadden in a Raiders jersey. Remember him going to the Cowboys too and having a thousand plus yard yes. season with the Cowboys. So that's a good pick. I didn't, I don't, I, full disclosure, I don't have Darren McFadden on my list. So that one kind of okay. took me by surprise. Okay. I went with a more historical, I went a more historical old school route. Now say ah. Clem Daniels. Clem Daniels, a good one. Clem, yes. Clem Daniels, two time all pro, four time pro bowler, won the AFL rushing title with 1,099 yards. Jim Brown that same year won the NFL rushing title uh, with the most yards between the NFL and the AFL. But Clem Daniels, when you talk about a running back who can catch out the backfield and is basically oh. a wide receiver when he's out running routes. That was Clem Daniels. Now, I know that's way back, 1961 to 1967, I believe. So you have to be a much older Raider fan to remember Clem Daniels. Even older than me, Mo. Even older <laughs> than me. But if you just, just look up Clem Daniels, please, and you'll understand why he made my list at five. Again, dual threat running back and running catch out the backfield, a bruising running back. Led the league in yards per catch at 22.8 can you imagine a running back averaging 22.8 22 yards per catch and i believe he had 30 catches that year so it wasn't like he had three catches no and it was just three big catches he he was a consistent threat in the passing game and you know what mo the thing about it and i'll let you finish on it but the one thing i just want to interrupt you on was he was so far ahead of his time being that dual Another. threat running back right you look at guys now they kind of have to be that way because of the way the offense is but if you look at the raiders and what they were doing in that time period especially after Al Davis took over um, was you saw that. And to your point, the yards per catch was huge and man, and he was just outside my top five, but a great, great player. No doubt about it. But when you Scott, really quick, when you talk about these players, a lot of, and we said this about, you know, some of the players that the Raiders had mm -hmm. LaMonica as, as a quarterback, we talked about players who were, you know, before their, before their time, like ahead of the, ahead of their time. And I think that's that goes to Al Davis and his innovative football mind that to 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 have the type of philosophy that is still could be in, implemented today shows how intelligent a football mind Al Davis was when he was living. So 
a lot of these raids that we're going to talk about in these lists, we're going to say, man, they were ahead of their time. And that, and that goes up to Al Davis and Clem Davis falls into that category. Oh, yeah. No question about it. And then, I mean, it, it paved the way for the players you saw come in later. Cliff Branch, all these guys, just amazing uh, and, and ahead of their time, too. Okay, so I had Derek McFadden. You have Clem Daniels. Who do you have at number four, Mr. Moten? Now, this is going to cause some consternation with uh -oh. the Long Reader Nation here. But I'm going with Bo Jackson at four. Wow. I know Bo a lot Jackson? of I, okay. I okay. know a lot of fans are gonna have him higher because that yeah. was the running back they grew up watching, and you see the highlights, and he's like a mythical figure, <laughs> not only within the Raiders, you know, folklore, but in the, general the NFL in, in yeah. NFL history. He's just it, you, when you talk about him, it's it's kind of like sitting your kids or your grandkids down and telling them a bedtime story of this of this mythological creature who <laughs> tormented defenders and ran them over i still remember him running over brian bosworth it was probably of one of my favorite moments but i have bo jackson at four simply because you had to game plan for bo jackson he's on the field he's one of the he was one of the rare running backs where you can't just say okay he's gonna just run the ball we have to just stack the box and stop him no you have to make sure you have some some of your top defenders assigned to bo jackson or else he's going to rip one off for like 80, 90 yards on you. <laughs> and three of his four seasons, he had the longest run across the league. Three of his four seasons, and those runs were, again, 80-plus yards. He was a pro bowler one year, almost, and he was a big part of the Raiders uh, getting to, the, I believe, the conference championship game in his last season. Now, he did battle injury start his career. He had four injury-riddled seasons. He wasn't even the top guy in his first two years because Marcus Allen was still there. He was a top rusher in his last two seasons with the Raiders. So I didn't put him in the top three because of that, because his very short stint wasn't the lead guy for two years. But again, when you talk about Raiders running backs, he's the biggest what if guy in probably oh, yeah. Raiders history. And if he had been healthy, who knows what Bo Jackson would have been and probably would have been a Hall of Famer. Yeah, and by the way, this is so interesting how our lists have 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 compiled because um, I talked about having Clem Daniels just inside the top five too, and I had Clem Daniels at three. By the way, I said outside the top five. I meant inside. I had him at three, um, and then I had Bo Jackson at two. So, oh, so wow. so yeah, and I, and the Bo Jackson, I I think it's partly because, and I know we, and in some ways I'm contradicting myself about the quarterback position, but the positions <laughs> are just different, right? They're just different. And and I agree with Bo Jackson. And maybe it's because when I was growing up at that period of time, even though I wasn't a Raiders fan, it was Bo Jackson. Like, like you said, you know, this is like me when I'm 80 telling my grandkids, yeah, Bo Jackson, one time he lifted the car off of, you know, the, the, the freeway and he <laughs> threw it over the ramp and then he got back and he rescued five people from a fire and then he ran down and, you know, did whatever. Because that's, you're right, the mythical, you talked about it. But I think Bo Jackson, too, because because of the the performances and the impact he had when he was on the field, just put him there. I, I Again, I didn't put him number one, of course, because I think, obviously, number one will be clear to everybody in a minute. But I had him there at number two, where you had him at number four. And I think it's just it's just that way. Now, again, these are all sub, these are all subjective. So okay. you, you could have some people will say, hey, look, I love Bo, but I'll never have him in my top ten. OK, great. Fine. That's fine. But I do think that just because of who he was and what he meant for that team and how he completely changed marketing. I mean, there's, you know, look what happened. You had him, then you had Deion Sanders, right? Those were the guys and Michael Jordan, of course, obviously, but in sports who, who carried that whole thing forward for what these athletes enjoyed today. And so that did factor in I, I, my number four, go ahead, go ahead. What quick, quick comment. Yeah. When you talk about who are the most exciting players to watch in nfl history bo oh, jackson is up there correct he doesn't have the production so that's why i don't have him in my top three right again four injury riddle season so that's why i don't have him in my top three but when you talk about one of the one of a kind unique players ever you've ever watched yeah bo jackson is in that conversation and that's why he's on my list even though he doesn't have the production some of the other players have on my list Correct. And, and, and that's why, I mean, I had Clem Daniels higher than you because of that, of the yardage and the production. Mm. I mean, remember he only played six years and people say, well, 5,100 yards. Yeah. It, it, in 1961 through 67, that's a lot. And 30 touchdowns is a lot too, but uh, good. So, so, so I have, and I'm just giving people my number two now because you had him number four. So I, I want to correlate there too, and we'll go over it at the end, but I want to give you my number four because it's different. And, and this is maybe a guy I don't think you might have on your list. 
And I know the, 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 the white beards out there will love this one. Um, but man, I, I look back at this one and it was kind of surprising because you look back and you know the name, but then you look back at it and you're like, dude was a badass. And that was Mark Van Egan. Van Egan. Okay. Van yep. Egan, 74 through 81. Uh, of course, he was on two Super Bowl teams with the Raiders mm -hmm. uh, in 11 and 15. And, and just that powerful running north-south vertical back. Again, 5,900 yards, 35 touchdowns in his career in seven years. And he really was, you know, because everybody remembers, of course, the vertical game from that era, right? When you're talking about those two first Super Bowls and you think about Cliff Branch and you think about the passing game uh, with, with Stabler and all that stuff and the ghost, you think about all those guys, but Mark Van Egan was the guy who was just pumping it down the middle and running the ball and softening up that line so that they could open up the vertical game. So I had Van Egan at four. Did you, you didn't have him on your list, right? Absolutely did. I have him at oh, three. Did? So we, oh, we correlate whoa, there. Oh, look at that. I have that. him at three. Okay, yeah. good, good. I didn't forget Mark. I know he okay. was a little before my time yes. before I was born. But looking up, I mean, he wasn't that far behind, you know, before I was born. But, right, you know, when you look at Mark Van Egan and you look at the record books for the Raiders, he is second all time <laughs> in total rushing yards. So yes. that that holds some weight. As you mentioned, two on two Super Bowl teams. Uh, one of those, I uh, believe he was a pro bowler also uh, one year. Mm -hmm. Another year, he shared the backfield with Kenny King. Of course, uh, a lot of you are familiar with Kenny King Jr. Shout out to him yep. on, on the X. Uh, his dad was also in the backfield with Mark Van Egan, and he was actually, Kenny King was the pro bowler, even though Mark Van Egan had more yards. Kenny King was a little more efficient. He was over Correct. four yards per carry. Mark Van Egan was under four yards per carry, I believe 3.8. Uh in one of the Raiders Super Bowl years. So while he does have, he does have that contribution to the Super Bowl teams, I believe in both those Super Bowl championship years with Mark Van Egan, the Raiders had a top 10 rushing attack. Now, again, yeah. part of that was Kenny King contributing to that backfield. And I believe the second year, but uh, Mark Van Egan was a big part of that. As you said, bruising, bruising rusher. who's also a fullback. So he, yes. he was a really good blocker. So he wasn't just contributing on the ground as a rusher, but also <laughs> in the blocking game blocking. as well. You have to recognize that. Well, and, and for the course, of, to have 5,900 yards in the course of his career as a fullback, I mean, and again, he, he bruised up that mid. I mean, he softened up that middle and and opened up the game for them. And like you said, for Kenny King and also for that passing game. So mm -hmm. you got to appreciate that. So Mark Van Egan was my number four. We got your number. We, now we got we got your number. No, we don't have your number four, right? Because we went. Yeah, yeah. Bo oh, yeah, Jackson's my number. Bo Jackson, number four. Number three, you had um, Mark, Vanny, Van, Mark, Van Egan. Mark Van Egan. Who? So who did you have at number two? I had Bo Jackson. Who did you have? Oh, this is going to cause a stir. Uh-oh, you're going to uh, put Josh this is gonna be. This is going to be controversial. Josh Jacobs is my oh! number two. Yes, yes. And this it. is... I and this is it. not and it. this is not recency bias. Let let right. hear me out, Raider Nation, because I know a okay. lot of you are saying Josh Jacobs, that that guy who who's ungrateful and didn't give a goodbye <laughs> to Raider Nation as he signed with the Green Bay Packers. How could you put Josh Jacobs at two? I'm not using my feelings for these rankings. Strictly numbers <laughs> and accomplishments here. Josh Jacobs was the second Raider to win a rushing title after you know who is number yeah. one. Yes, Josh Jacobs, the second Raider to win a rushing title. He is second all time in rushing yards per game in a season. He's also second, I believe, in total rushing yards in the season. He had that sixteen fifty three yard uh, season in twenty twenty two. Also a pro, a pro, a pro bowler, an all pro, multi time pro bowler, and all pro. Led the league in scrimmage yards that same year in twenty twenty two. Led the league in rushing, obviously, because he had has the rushing title. So. His numbers pretty much stack up. He's pretty much top three in a lot of the rushing categories all time for the Raiders. So regardless of how you feel about Josh Jacobs and how he left uh, Raider Nation, how he exited and went to Green Bay, you got to respect the numbers. And the numbers say that he he is in the top three, at for me at least. When you stack up, when you stack up, Rushing yards per game, total rushing yards. The fact he was the second Raider to win a rushing title, mm -hmm. behind you know who we'll discuss in a, in a moment. <laughs> his accolades, his production are all there. The only thing that he didn't do was contribute to a a successful Super Bowl winning or playoff team that went deep, and and that's not all on him. Can't blame him all for that, but the production was definitely there. There were times where the passing game wasn't functioning well and, and they had to ride. The Raiders had to ride Josh Jacobs to a lot of wins. 
And before you see, and I and I get I get the sour feelings of how he left, but think back to when Josh Jacobs was a Raider, and the Raiders depended on him to to move the football because for whatever reason the passing game wasn't intact, or they had a switching of of coaching ranks, and you got a quarterback who's inexperienced. And you have to ride that workhorse. And Josh Jacobs is one of the rare workhorse running backs in today's, in the modern league. Because, you know, a lot of teams now, they roll with two, three running backs. He was one of the guys that I know he was nicked up. But he played most of those games. And again, won a rushing title. The second Raider to do it. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, respect there. And I and, and I and I could, you know, I had I considered having him at five. I took McFadden instead as a surprise. But uh, but I see that, too. I think I think Josh Jacobs is one of those cases, too, where, yeah, the teams he was on, number one, because you're right, it's not all his fault. And number two, they leaned on him so heavily that, you know, that wears on you. And we saw that in the last few years, too, with injuries and getting nicked up and all that kind of stuff. Again, not his fault. When you when you don't have anything else to use or everything's not moving, uh, that that's what happens. So so I understand that. But uh, but the surprise, I'm sure people it'll be a polarizing one because you're right, especially with recency, because people get get you said it. They get their feelings hurt when players leave. And then, of course, just this last week, Josh Jacobs was commenting on the. The instability of the Raider organization is one of the reasons he wanted to leave because there was just never anything stable about it when he was there. And and he's right there. I mean, you can't you cannot argue with him on that one. Um, there's other things you could, but not that. So so a good call there on uh, Josh Jacobs. I wonder what everybody else thinks out there. You have to drop it in the comments. Before Raider fans scream at me for having Josh Jacobs at <laughs> number two, I just want to throw one more stat out there. Stat out there. He is the Raiders franchise leader in rushing yards you know in a game and yeah. i believe 76 yards you know per game this is now this yeah. is over the totality of his raider tenure so Correct. you take you know all of these running backs and and you take you know average out their attempts and and totally rushing yards josh jacobs is number one in rushing yards per game at 76 number one he's the franchise leader more than our number one who i sure who i'm sure we agree on more than mark <laughs> van hegan more than Bo Jackson in that short stint, he's the guy who leads the franchise and rushing yards per game at 76. Number one. So that holds yeah. weight with me. I was just going to mention that because when I was looking at his stats, you know, seeing him there second or third all time from a yards perspective, and then seeing, and as I was going through the columns and seeing where he ranked, I'm like, whoa, 76. Nice. Mm -hmm. So there you go. So Mo's got Josh Jacobs at number two. As I said, I had. Bo Jackson. So let's just review. Uh, I had Darren McFadden at five. You had Bo Jackson at five, correct? Clem and, Daniels at five. I'm sorry, Clem Daniels at five. Thank you. At four, you had Bo Jackson. I had Mark mm -hmm. Van Egan. At three, you had Mark Van Egan. And I had mm -hmm. Clem Daniels. <laughs> uh, I had Bo Jackson at two, and you had Josh Jacobs. Jacobs at two. And Mo. I don't have a drum roll. I probably could have put in a sound effect, but I'll save everybody that. Uh, number one, your number one running back for the Raiders in Raiders history. I can't imagine who it would be. Some dude named Marcus Allen. I don't, I don't know. I just a uh, uh, you know fly by night type of guy. Just you know Hall of Famer, right. six time Pro Bowler. You know Raiders rushing leader in rushing yards um, in a season. Averaging 109.8 yards in the season. Raiders all-time leader in, in total rushing yards in the season is 1759. Three years of 11-plus rushing touchdowns. Three years of 1,000-plus rushing for him. Also, that applies to Josh Jacobs and Mark Van Egan. But Marcus Allen also a big part of the, of the passing game. Over 5,400 receiving yards and 21 touchdowns as a Raider. So uh, we, we can talk all about his tenure with the Raiders from 82 to 92 i don't know what happened to him after that i i don't i i, I kind of forget <laughs> maybe bump my head i don't know what happened to marcus allen after no, that yeah. did i didn't really follow his career after after the yeah. <laughs> if you can enlighten me where he went after that but uh one of the all-time great raiders <laughs> marcus allen is the easy number one running back 100 percent agree and i mean marcus allen of course like you said rookie of the year 1982 led the league in 1985 and rushing was the nfl mvp uh, that 74 yard touchdown in the Super Bowl. I mean, it's it's top five Super Bowl highlight of all time. I mean, that's how good it is. Might even be top two. I, I could argue. 
and also, of course, like me, a San Diego kid, he went to Abraham Lincoln High School, Lincoln High School there before going to USC as well. So Marcus Allen just, you know, he was so much fun to watch. And and I just remember because he came, he was the NFL draft, I think it was 82. And so I was, I was a young guy, but I do remember like watching TV news with my dad and seeing, oh, we got Marcus Allen highlights tonight from the CIF sectionals, right? <laughs> from the, the the championship, they played Kearney High School. And it was just, it made headlines all over the country because he did so well. And so Marcus Allen, just amazing guy. And I think that, you know, I know Raider fans of all ages, of course, know who he is, but just go back and watch, watch his college tape, watch, if you can find some of the high school stuff, great. If not, uh, you know, obviously his Raiders highlights, just amazing. And and not only that, but I know that the, the, whatever the disagreement ended up being, and I know there's all sorts of people who've said what it was and what it wasn't of why him and Al Davis you know, kind of broke it off and why Al Davis was sitting him and eventually traded him to the Kansas City Chiefs, um, all that, or let him go to the Kansas City Chiefs. All that stuff to me uh, is is water under the bridge. And even Marcus Allen came back. I know I know that uh, that Mr. Davis was gone by then, but, you know, buried the hatchet with Mark and with the organization. And that was great because I think Raider Nation at that time needed that, especially with what happened. So to me, there's no question that Marcus Lamar Allen – is the best running back in the history of the Raiders. Um, do, do you remember? Do you what's your first memory of him, Mo? First memory of him is probably as I now when he was a Raider, I was still young. I was I was six years old. So I as a kid, I just remember watching him and, and just kind of being at awe. But then as I got a little older and watching some of his highlights, as you talked about, you know, the Raiders Super Bowl run. I became more appreciative of what he was for the Raiders. Now, of course, yeah. by the time I started to really understand football, he was already with the Chiefs. Mm. But you still knew about his, you know, you still saw his Raider highlights. And that was, for me, as a, as a homegrown Raider coming from California, he always, you know, to be a Raider. Won yeah. a Super Bowl with the Raiders. Uh, to me, the highlight of his career, again, three 1,000-yard rushing seasons with the Raiders. I, I just remember him being an all-time great as a kid, as one of the best football players that I'm gonna I'm gonna see as a, as a young kid, uh, just getting into football before I kind of proclaimed to be a Raider fan. Because remember, I became a Raider fan in '94 officially. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of just like planted my flag, like this is my football team. But as a young kid, you're just enjoying the game and just enjoying these athletes, and you're like, "Well, who's that guy?" You know, yeah. and he just kind of <laughs> stood out. You know, and after like again after. You know, he goes to the Chiefs and you look back and you're now proclaiming, as I did, being a Raider fan at eight, nine years old. And you're looking back at those highlights and you're like, wow, this guy was extraordinary. I wish he had finished his career with the Raiders, but it is what yeah. it is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it happens too much. I mean, you saw Montana with the 49ers go to the Chiefs, ironically, at the same time <laughs> uh, as well. So so kind of strange there. But, you know, it's interesting with, with this list and, and looking at this list kind of kind of brought up for me, Mo was was we've talked about it for the last year and a half, really, because of the Josh Jacobs situation with the Raiders. And that was just how the running back position has changed in the NFL and how it's not that, you know, the bell cow of the team, man, you needed that dominant Marcus Allen type running back, that Bo Jackson type running back to, to lead your offense, right? Instead, now you have guys still talented running backs. Don't get me wrong. But they're not. It's it's it goes for the same with linebackers, right? We used to have Lawrence Taylor, and I know I sound like the old guy, get off my lawn, but <laughs> but it's it's just it shows you how the game changes, and so you start to look at running backs like this, and and rightfully so, you had a great argument of having Josh Jacobs up there in this top five list, but overall, you have to wonder like, you know, what is going to be a great running back moving forward in the NFL, even in a franchise history, not just from the league perspective, because there's always going to be a guy or two, I think, who are so phenomenally of athletes that they're going to stick out. But the rest of them and the position has changed so much, it might change how we evaluate these guys five, ten years down the line. Yeah, I mean, you can guarantee that the you know things are going to change you know, five, 10 years down the line because the NFL is, is an evolving league. While the basics stay the same, it's a physical sport. You know, you got to catch the football. There are things that philosophy wise, how the positions are used, things are going to change. I remember when, um, you know, running back started to become more of a collective effort. 
the run game, mm-hmm. I should say, it started to become a more collective effort. Your Adrian Petersons, you know, don't exist, don't come up, don't grow up trees now. It's kind of like, okay, we're going to have three running backs. Each of you is going to have a specific role. You're going to have the early down carries. You're going to have the third down pass catching. And the third guy may either share early down carries with the first guy or share pat the pass catching role with the second guy. And that's I think that's how it's going to work. The Raiders just kind of to siphon off to some news. Vic Tafer, I believe, wrote in a piece recently. He believes that the Raiders are going to add another running back to yeah. their backfield. So the, for the people who picked Samir White to be their sleeper to win a rushing title, might have to put the brakes on that because the Raiders <laughs> may have four running backs touching the football this upcoming season, which isn't great for fantasy football purposes. But if you know Tom Trusco and you're familiar with his work with the Chargers, you know that he he rotated his running backs, and that's probably what we're going to see with the Raiders going forward. Yeah, let's take a quick break here, Mo. When we come back, we'll pick up on that discussion. Another question, too, and, and I've seen some people – uh, kind of, kind of, kind of message me online the last few weeks about the status of Colton Miller because we don't have a status because they've been out of camp, they haven't been in camp yet. He, you know, the injury, how's he coming back? People are getting nervous that he may start. So when we come back, we'll kind of wrap a, a bow around the show with some of that discussion around the running back, adding a running back, and then of course some of the other question marks as we approach Raiders camp coming up here real soon. Oh, you can feel it, can't you? I can feel it. I can feel it. So can they in Vegas where it's 120 degrees and they're going to have to practice inside because they have no choice. But anyway, we're coming back right here on Silver and Black today in Odyssey Sports Original Podcast. Final segment coming up right after the break. Welcome back, home stretch here on Silver and Black today, the Tuesday edition. Of course, we appreciate you guys being with us. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, please do so wherever you get your audio. If you're watching us on YouTube, thanks. Hello. We appreciate seeing you here and participating in the chat. Make sure you like subscribe and hit that notifications bell we certainly appreciate it as always mo moton scott Branson, back with you we just got done counting down our five top running backs in raiders history and then mo brought up the news item that he saw from the athletic about the raiders perhaps adding another running back and it goes back to a conversation we had a couple weeks ago about running backs mo we talked about zamir white we talked about alexander madison and kind of what their roles might be but with what Tom Telesco has done, and you brought that up, was very important from a historic perspective, what he did when he was the GM of the Chargers, is he likes to bring in guys to compete at positions. I know a lot of GMs say that we want competition, blah, blah, blah. Tom Telesco has a record of doing that. Definitely has a record of doing that. A lot of people remember Austin Eckler because he was the main guy. But if you are familiar with Austin Eckler's game, he's not the type of running back you're going to hand the ball to 20 times between the tackles. Right. So the Chargers, while the Chargers struggled to find that number two guy, they consistently, continuously brought in guys. I remember Justin Jackson was there for a bit. They got Isaiah Spiller in the fourth round not too long ago. So they've had multiple guys in there to try to spell Austin Eckler. Hopefully he has better success spelling Zamir White with the Raiders. And I, and I think he will. Alexander Madison, maybe not the most exciting pickup. But he's a decent number two, and, and we've mm-hmm. pointed this out, that he's been more efficient as a number two backup reserve complementary change of pace running back. Dylan Lowby, again, I think is going to be involved in the third down passing game. Now, if the Raiders do add another running back, who knows? It could be Dalvin Cook. If you're looking at some of the bigger names, Dalvin Cook is still available. Now, he isn't Dalvin Cook from the Minnesota Vikings days rushing for 1,000 yards, but he could still be effective, mm-hmm. you know, getting 100 touches in the season as a change of pace guy or as your second or third running back. So if they, if they were to bring in a Dalvin cook at a, at a decent price, I'd be okay with it. Yeah. And can you imagine Madison's reaction if they brought in Dalvin cook? And, whoa, 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 whoa. What again. do you mean? I just got away from this. What are you doing to me here? Uh, guys but, together again. But all, it's, <laughs> in all seriousness. Yeah. I think there's some, there's some good free agents out there too. And some names, it all depends what they want to do. But again, I think that this is, a, this points to a good sign. And it also points to what we've heard from coach Antonio Pierce, which is they want to round, they want to run the ball. They understand that they're going to throw the ball too. He said, make no question about it. We're going to, we're going to go vertical too, but we need that running game to be able to, to get this going. And so they need to make sure they don't go into the season feeling less than confident in the guys that, and again, that may be Madison and white, maybe two of the two of them and the third, and they feel really good about it. But I think until you know that, especially going into camp, you want to be able to do that. And, and Mo, I, I had somebody message me a couple of times about Colton Miller. We haven't heard anything about Colton Miller because they're not have been in cam. But but when you look at it, I'm not concerned until they get to camp. And if he 
you know, it's not un, un, unusual for guys to be held to lighter workouts at the beginning, especially if they're veterans. But at what point should Raider Nation start to be like, hmm, if we don't see Colton Miller out there working out, if that's in case, in, indeed, what happens? If it's the week before the season and he's <laughs> not on the field, then there's a cause for concern there because then he can end up on a pup list and then he would automatically miss you know, yeah. multiple games to start the season. And then you're starting the season with maybe Andrews Pete at left tackle. Now Andrews Pete played well at left tackle with the New Orleans Saints last year. So maybe not a huge deal, but I wouldn't worry about Colton Miller yet. Be mm -hmm. simply because you know, he's not going to play in the preseason. He's, he's a veteran. He doesn't need any preseason action. You just need him to get on the practice field and knock off a little bit of rust maybe. And that's it. You don't, you don't need him to actually play in any exhibition games because he's earned that. As long as he's on the field by week one, that that's all that really matters for the Raiders. Yeah, and we're going to get into next week, obviously rolling up to camp. We're going to get into to our biggest question marks and the battles to watch. Not only, I'm sure, Mo, you and I are both right about it, but also we'll talk about it here on the show because we got to get into some of those. We've talked about them over the months, but now as we start to get into camp, we'll have a better idea of what's going on there. By the way, if you look at that list, you talked about uh, available free agent running backs. If the Raiders do bring somebody, and you mentioned da Dalvin Cook, you also have Cam Akers out there. You have Josh Kelly, Latavius Murray, remember him? Um, <laughs> and I think Kareem Hunt signed, did he not? He, he's on this list here, but I think he already signed. Uh, Matt Breida, and you have, Jay, uh, you have uh, Melvin Gordon, another former Charger who obviously Tom Telesco is familiar with, although I don't think he's got much left in the tank. Uh, Brandon Bolden, we know who he is. And from there on, it kind of falls off a cliff. But but I, listen, those top three, four names are significant guys. I mean, they're not what they used to be, but certainly if you're going to bring a name in or you're going to bring a body in, those are all guys who you might uh, look to get get some touches out of each week and and might have enough left in the tank where if their touches are limited and they're sharing a backfield might be able to do it for them. To be honest, I hope they give one of the young guys a shot to earn a spot over yeah. bringing in an older veteran like Dalvin Cook or or Melvin Gordon. Just please stay away from Melvin Gordon. He can't oh. even hold on to the football. And he, this fumbles point in his career. Constantly. he fumbles he fumbles constantly. way too many times, yeah. way too much at this point in his career. I wouldn't touch Martin Melvin Gordon with a 10 foot pole, but by the young guys, I mean, I'm talking about Britton Brown and Sincere McCormick. Yes. I, I think the Raiders should Good give point. those two guys a lot of run in the preseason, you know, even in these joint practices and see what they got. Because maybe they're good enough or better than some of the older running backs that you mentioned a minute ago. And I think if he, and I was high on Britton Brown last year before he got hurt. It was unfortunate. But this is a guy that at, at a UCLA was the workhorse back and produced pretty well at an optimal level. And I think Britton Brown can make the roster if, he, if given the chance, maybe even sincere McCormick who has shown some flashes in the last couple of years during the preseason. So I think yeah. one of those guys is they're worth a look. Right. And without, without Josh Jacobs there now too, like this is where if you're one of those guys and you want to step up and prove that you deserve it, this is when you have to do it because it's open. Right. I mean, Okay, you give a little edge to Zamir White. I don't think, even though they brought in Alexander Madison, I don't think he's a guy that they're looking at as you know their savior. So I think that if you look at all of that, people people have to say to themselves, if I'm Britton Brown or one of those guys, Sincere McCormick, okay, man, this is it. This could be like a, a career-defining moment for me. If I can step up and have a camp of my life and I can solve this problem for this team, uh, then certainly that would make – that. I mean – it would just help that offense significantly because who's to say Alexander Madison is even a lock to make the roster. I'm not trying to cause controversy here, but it's not like the Raiders signed him to the biggest deal ever. I mean, a lot of these guys that you, every, every off season since the race have been improving their roster every off season, there's a guy or two that gets cut. And you're like, wow, the Raiders cut that guy. And it's surprise. It comes out of left field. And it is a guy that you think is going to make the fit, the initial 50 man roster and he doesn't make it. So, not to say Alexander Madison is going to get cut, but I, I think I think when you tap into that young talent and and, the, and fresh legs, I, I think that's important, especially if you want a rotation. If you don't want to have Zamir White carry the ball 15 to 20 times a game, if you'd rather him be between 12 or 14 carries, fine. I think Zamir White does better with more volume. Mm -hmm. But if you want to keep him between, between 12 and 14, 15 carries and you want to mix in Alexander Madison here and there and have a versatile running back, Tap into one of the young guys and see what you got. Now, I know 
Tom Tusk doesn't have an allegiance to those guys because they were there before he got there. So maybe right. that's why the Raiders may sign a veteran because he didn't bring those guys in. But at least give them a chance to show you what they got before you kind of move them to the practice squad. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, I don't know if you saw the story too, since we're bouncing around a little bit here. Uh, Sportico did a did a a story on revenue sharing. So you know, if if people don't understand it out there, just to explain it on a very surface level, every year the NFL um, they share it's a pot of money. So all the money that comes into the league basically gets shared out amongst the teams. And if you look at last year, uh, what they show is that the Raiders and the 31 other teams pulled in between 402 and 425 million because of the league's revenue sharing program. The pool has around 13 billion dollars in it. Let's let 13 billion. That's the NFL as a business. Just so you understand that. Um, now the, the Raiders overall, it's about a 115% increase from 10 years ago. So now they're saying that, uh, within 10 years, the Raiders, if, if the, if the rate continues at the same mo, the Raiders will be pulling in $800 million a year by 2033. They could be almost a billion dollar business, just the one team in Las Vegas as well. And remember, they also get 34% of ticket revenue, which is another $20 million. Uh, and, and while there are other owners who have a lot more money than Mark Davis, including Stan Kroenke and all those guys, it just goes to show you that when people, oh, this team's poor, that team's poor, not really. <laughs> they're, they're all sharing in this big pool of, of, of billions of dollars. So in other words, the NFL is doing pretty Good. well. Yeah, say, doing right? okay. Doing okay, right? <laughs> All the people who are boycotting the NFL, I don't. I, where are those people? Because not yes. that anytime soon. No, and that's the thing is, it's a huge business, and so like when people and we've talked about it on the show here, we talk about going to eighteen weeks, and I just had a conversation for Sports Not with Adam Kaplan last week, and we were talking about the games and going to eighteen weeks, and even Joe Burrow today was talking about, uh, eight, hey, if we go eighteen weeks, why don't we have two bye weeks, and then why don't we have a bye week? Let's kind of like a break type of thing. So, so players are obviously on board with it because they see the kaching kaching. They understand that not only are the owners going to make money, but they too will make money because they'll have some sort of concession from the owners they'll have to give because they'll have to play another game. But getting two buys and stuff like that, it's going to be something we're going to watch out. We'll get guests on this year to talk about it as it heats up because the league usually will start to move at that stuff towards their kind of uh, winter meetings, if you will, before the season starts. So we'll, we'll get into that. There's, there's so many fascinating things going on with the league, the international. I think, Mo, I really think, not that I'm in big in favor of it all and there's lots of problems they got to figure out, but I'm going to tell you, I think I think within the next two to three years, we're going to get an announcement about some international play a team, a team in international. I don't know who, if it's somebody who moves or if they expand, but I really believe that uh, we're going to see that pretty soon. I don't see how that would work, though, simply because that international team is going to have, especially with an 18 game schedule, is going to have nine home games. So a team is going to have to do a lot of traveling every mm -hmm. week to play them. And they're going to have to do a lot of traveling coming back to the coming into the states to play. So I don't know how the logistics would work yeah. on that. Maybe you maybe you have an idea that you can. Well, Roger Goodell there. Well, well, no, but I, I here's what I think. And, and I know and I don't just say this because of our audience or my proximity or where I grew up. But to me, it makes the most sense. Uh, and there's some logistics and, and, and political problems that, that get in the way a little bit. To me, it makes sense to start with Mexico. Because, you, you know what I'm saying? So if you start with Mexico City, I know the, the the altitude and all that BS, but nonetheless, Denver, it's less, but still it's high. Um, but if you look at Mexico City, you're basically in the central time zone, right? It's a little closer. It's still a, a nice, it's like flying across country, yes. But it's still, from a time perspective, it's in the same hemisphere, for God's sake, mm. right? So, mm -hmm. So to me, that makes more sense because if you start going to Europe, for example, and you're right. So if I'm the Raiders and I got to go play in Europe, like, first of all, they, they'd have to figure out some sort of system to where you're, if you're going to play a game in Europe, you, you definitely get a buy either before or after whatever it is. So you get two weeks to prepare for it. But the Raiders did that even when they were, were traveling to London and it was still hard. So I think you have to wait to go full bore, like into Europe, which is, I think where they want to go. Uh, 
until you have enough to put a division over there where they can play each other enough, you know, where you're having, you're having two games a year against your European division and then you're playing other teams. So to me, that's, that's the only way to do it. Cause if you just have one standalone team over there and then you don't get any of the rivalries in Europe, like they have with the soccer stuff, like, you know, if you're in Berlin and you have a Frankfurt team, great, you're, you're going at it. But if you have Berlin and then you have London, okay, there's a little bit of a thing there, but it's not the same. It's not regional or Berlin and the jets, you know, big deal. So, so I think that that's the things that got to work out. But to me, Mexico would make the most sense first. I just think that the instability of the country there, what's happening there makes it a little bit difficult. Although the games there have been successful. So we'll see. I believe that Chiefs Rams game, which is one of the highest scoring games in NFL history was played in Mexico. City. Yes, it was so, stadium Azteca there, where the there, Raiders. There's, last some, played there's some, there's some good, uh, good vibes as the young people say in Mexico city. In yes. I think though, too, the other thing that benefits the Raiders, if there was, if there was a team in Mexico city, there's a lot of Raiders fans in Mexico. We know that we saw that when they were there, not only that, but of course, a lot of the Raider fans would love to go to Mexico for, for away games. So, so yeah, that's just that, but we'll get into that. I'm sure we'll have some guests on this year. We'll start to think about what's going on with the NFL, but we're getting ready for camp Mo. So the next time we talk, we'll get into a little bit of the camp battles, see if there's any news that pops up there, but let everybody know what you got coming up. I know you have a piece coming up on sports, not, but let everybody know what's happening in the world of Midtown Mo. So, quick note, I will be back on TNT Sports tonight on Tuesdays. Woo! Some Raider topics could be coming up there on the on the tube, on the TV, so check that out. There's some exciting things going on in camp for the Raiders. Of course, big quarterback competition, so, you know, that's going to be a talking point. Over at Sports Now, I'm going to have – basically, I'm going to talk about the rookies. I'm going to go over the rookies. I know it's been a lot of talk about the rookies since the draft, but I'm going to project – what their role will be this year. So are they going to be a starter, backup player, practice squad player? I, I'll tell you what I think the role will be and how many of them do I think make the roster. And I, if you've been listening to my Bleach Report Lies, you probably know the answer to that already. But I'll tell you what I think, how I think they'll fit in to the Raiders 50-man roster in September. There you go. I love it. And I will be doing something on the Raiders. I'm not sure yet. I haven't decided yet. I've been so busy with video if you don't see the videos, uh, I, I tweet them out from Sports Not. I do a daily sports kind of update thing, and I'm even doing entertainment. Mo, I'm, I took out I, I, you. You were my 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 inspiration to getting on TV. So I have to start talking about like like tomorrow. I got to talk about Britney Spears. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. Britney Spears says she doesn't want to date men anymore. I don't know what that means. Other than <laughs> I don't know if there's a different, like, does that mean she'll date somebody else? Like a woman? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm just telling you. But anyway, <laughs> make sure you catch Mo tomorrow night. Or I should say tonight on TN, TNT, right? You said? TNT Sports. True TV is where it'll air. 5.30 or 6.30. I'll, I'll probably tweet it out before it airs. Just let you know where it'll show up. But there again, there will be some Raider topics talked about in those TNT Sports tonight shows simply because, again, the quarterback competition. Antonio Pierce is a big draw. A lot of people yeah. like to talk about what he's doing and his pathway to becoming a head coach. So while the quarterback competition is un uninspiring for a lot of people because Aiden O'Connell is a fourth-round pick and Gardner Minshew has been a backup spot starter, still a lot going on at Raider Nation. Still a lot to talk about. Still a lot to be excited about this summer. I can't wait to talk about cornerbacks because that's a big battle. Cornerback is going to be a battle. big battle. By the way, are you? I want to make sure though that like the the little intern who go gets you coffee when you're about to go on TV, are you treating them okay? Like you you give them a little tip or something? I mean, listen, I I might as well be the intern on on the TV <laughs> side of things because I I just yap on a podcast and I write in in seclusion and now they're putting me on TV, so I'm getting my feet wet on the on another avenue so I, i'm getting on there with coy wire who played with the buffalo bills and the falcons yeah. and he's been gracious calling me an expert when i get on there he makes me feel welcome so shout out to coy wire if he's somehow listening to the show i don't I know, know why he would be but if he is shout <laughs> <out to Coy laughs> wire. Come on, Corey, subscribe man we need it uh but anyway no, we appreciate that always uh all right well listen we will catch up with you if something pops up we'll catch up with you later in the week if not mm -hmm. we will see you next week we're almost out of this once a week thing, and then we're going to get back to welcome them on some great sponsors, some cool stuff to tell you guys about when we hit camp. So make sure you do that. We got some new intro music coming. Oh, yeah. It might include 
some Mo singing. I'm just saying he might not remember this, <laughs> but we, we got no, I'm just kidding. But we, we got a bunch of new stuff coming out here at Odyssey. So make sure you keep track of that. Mo, my friend, I will see you next time. Talk to you soon. All right. For our producer, Mike Robbie, a former moat, and I'm Scott Branson. Thanks again for being with us, Raider Nation. We will talk to you next time. Take care.